our art nerds. Today I'm taking a look at the Cool Bank watercolor palette. So not only am I taking a look at the palette itself, but I'm going to be taking a look at and reviewing the accessories that come with the palette and letting you guys know whether or not I think this was a good deal for $20.99 or if you should pass on this one. So this is part of a two-part review. This is the unboxing swatch. We're going to figure a lot of things out together. We're going to swatch our watercolors, but I'm not going to give a final verdict until I've completed the field test where I attempt to paint a watercolor illustration using these watercolors. So stick around for the second part of this review, which will be coming up a little bit later on. This is part of a multi watercolor palette review series, my student grade showdown, where I'm going to be reviewing and comparing a bunch of really affordable watercolor palettes. For those of you who are interested in getting into watercolor but you don't necessarily want to or you can't necessarily afford to invest in more expensive palettes. A lot of these palettes are available through Amazon and AliExpress so hopefully some of my friends in other countries will be able to find these palettes if they think they look good. So let's go ahead unbox and swatch the Cool Bank watercolor palette. Nerds, today I'm going to be reviewing, I'm going to be unboxing and swatching the Cool Bank watercolor paint set. This 83 piece set was purchased off of Amazon and I paid around $20.99 for it. If by the end of this unboxing swatch review you think you would like to have one of your very own, I'll have a link down in the description for you guys as well as links to other useful watercolor resources and my show notes for this review. So we have here a hefty cardboard package. We're getting a lot of stuff for $20.99. We are getting a 72 watercolor cake, a six paint brush, a 124 page watercolor pad, two sponge, one plastic palette, and one gift box. I love that they count the box that it comes in as one of the things we're actually receiving. And they all seem to be Cool Bank branded. And they want us to know, warning, not suitable for children under three years of age due to or two small components which may constitute a choking hazard and functional sharp edges on sharpener. And caution, colors may stain. It is not appropriate for not to three small onions and they recommend that we retain information for future use. So you guys might be wondering why I'm reviewing a watercolor set like this one. When I was doing my preliminary research for this set, it's definitely a set recommended at hobby artists as well as children. And I don't really fall into either categories, but people are always asking me to recommend good, affordable watercolor sets for them. And it's become a bit of my white whale. I've been highly encouraged by my success with the Mei Liang, Shapira Farben, and Superior palettes. And I know there's a possibility of other white label, but great watercolor sets out there for you guys. I also want to point out that I am reviewing this set post Hurricane Ida. I still don't have full internet access yet, so I'm probably going to miss some things and I apologize if I miss important things. I've done my best to do, be diligent about my research, but I think it would be wonderful and very gracious that if you guys know something, if you can add something here to let me know in the comments below. It would be a really big help and I'd really appreciate it. So originally this set came with a big old ship label across the front and came to my doorstep as is. It was like the label and no further Amazon packaging. I, I would not exactly call that a gift box Amazon. So I did my best to remove the original label itself. You can still see some residue because it actually gives you an idea of what the packaging itself looks like. It is also sealed on the back with a little bit of tape. So I've already sl or I sliced it for you guys. Let's go ahead and see what Cool Bank has in store for us. So 
So here are our two sponges. Usually sponges in watercolor means natural sponges so that you can do interesting lift techniques. But lately with water brush products, they include sponges so you can scrub your water brushes. I think these are supposed to serve both purposes. Here is our six pack, or actually this is a five pack of brushes. We have three flats and two rounds. Here is our plastic palette. These are pretty common. You can get these over at Dollar Tree. Here is our Cool Bank watercolor pad. It is acid free, heavyweight, cold press. 300 GM is about 140 pounds, so a little heavier than cardstock. And this is just a pad of paper, it's not a block. I would bet this is cellulose. Usually when they don't tell you what the paper type is, it's cellulose. And this is very much a student grade set. And then finally, at the very, very, very bottom, ooh, this is, this is heavy. I wish we had phyllo, no I don't, Never mind. this is YouTube. This is a heavy watercolor set. Cool Bank also makes color pencils and the sort of inexpensive artist kits that you can usually find at Walmart and Michaels. They also offer acrylics. I would bet this is a white label product. If you have any leads on the original manufacturer, please let me know. It's gotten really difficult to track that sort of information down. And I know some of you guys really don't like when I complain about the packaging. Some of you feel like it kind of derails from the product itself. Everything here from the sponges to the already plastic palette to the five instead of six water brushes to the metal watercolor tin to the pad of paper has been wrapped in plastic. You did not need plastic on this, this, or this. And um, even if they felt like we needed some sort of wrapping material just to make it seem more gift-like, they could have done tissue paper, wrapping paper, recycled Excelsior, just something that's not all this plastic garbage that's gonna end up thrown away in the bin. And the recording quality on this is gonna be fun because this kind of plastic makes for just delectable audio. Listen, here, have some ASMR. There. I know I gave someone the tingles and then somebody else an, a migraine because that's how that works. So uh, the last time I got a pad of paper <laughs> with my watercolors, it was the Shapiro Farben and I really hated the paper they included. It was really not fun for me. So I didn't even use it for the field test. Uh, I'm real on the fence about this. We'll see. I might do a mud test with this just to see if it's salvageable for me at all. Um, best case Ontario, it is a cellulose watercolor paper that has a texture embossed onto it so that technically it's heavy enough that you could use it for watercolor or you could use it for mixed media. Um, maybe not a great fit for watercolor but still useful for watercolor. Worst case Ontario, I'm gonna hate it and wanna chuck it in the bin along with all this plastic. Look at this, why do we need shrink wrap? Just a little bit of tape would have sufficed. Now I do actually like the metal tin that these watercolors came in, you know? That actually, I think, promises better quality than maybe what I had initially expected. So, hi, hello, if you're new here, I'm Becca. I am a watercolor comic artist. I draw and write and paint the comic Seven Inch Kara, which you guys can read for freezies as a web comic over at sevenincharacom I also am a watercolor illustrator. I also am an art educator, although, you know, more sometimes than all the times. And I also review watercolor and drawing and comic supplies. And I do that through the eyes of a comic artist. So I think in general, I have something pretty unique, pretty interesting, pretty different 
to add to the watercolor conversation. So when you guys see me reviewing watercolors, like this cool bank set here, it's be I'm looking for watercolors that would I could see myself using for illustration, even if they wouldn't necessarily be my first choice, they are usable. I'm also looking for watercolors that I could happily recommend to somebody else and not feel like they've wasted their money or not feel like I have to give all these extra explanations for how to get the most out of the watercolors I like straightforward art supplies for the most part. And I know a lot of artists would like to get into watercolor but are a bit daunted by how expensive it seems. So I am trying to review more student grade watercolors, ex you know, inspired by my success with the Superior pa palette, the Shapiro Farben palette, the Mei Liang palette, to try and find some more watercolor palettes that are affordable and accessible that people can buy for themselves or buy to give as gifts because honestly, Growing up being interested in art since a very young age, I loved getting art supply gifts. And I really loved the fact that my grandparents spent a lot of time selecting stuff that they knew I would enjoy. My grandfather also enjoyed art. So I just have these really treasured memories from a very young age of art supplies that were age appropriate for my ability, but you know, also I didn't have to fight to use them. So that's what I'm looking for when I'm reviewing these kind of student grade watercolors. And I'll get into kind of the nitty gritty of what I'm looking for even more a little bit further into the review. I'm so glad we found our missing sixth watercolor brush. There was neatly tucked into the palette. So inside this set, we have a color map. This is an approximated color map. These are digital colors rather than the actual colors. Um, it does say something about refillable water brush pins with different tips. I guess what they mean is not it came with a bunch of different tips, but rather there's a bunch of different tips on the pins themselves. It also came with a, I would not say this is watercolor paper. It has a coating on the back, so it's actually um, water resistant, I would think. But it does have a bit of texture to it, so... Here is our swatch chart with all of the color numbers and color names. There's also supposedly some metallics in here. And I think it, it doesn't really correlate one to one. So it starts, here's the top with white and it starts here at the bottom. Uh, well, it could be very confusing. Uh, what else? So we can already see and i'll pull you guys in closer for a closer look. we can already see just from the mass tone that is the color of these watercolors in their half pans we can already see from the mass tone that these are going to be full of optical brighteners extenders additives that are added to your watercolors to make them cheaper to use less pa uh, pigment and to make them seem brighter and more appealing in their half pans and this is typically done more often or in greater abundance with half pans like these than it is with tube watercolors because with tube watercolors you're not really like looking at the the tube watercolor like the color of the how do i put this the mass tone of the paint in the tube if that makes sense you're looking at a swatch and that's selling you but with these kind of half pan watercolors you're looking at the half pans and you're looking at the swatches and that's what's kind of selling you. So we can see just looking at it right now, there's gonna be a lot of optical brighteners. Why is that a bad thing? Well, they have a, a tendency to make anything you paint liftable, turn to mud. They just really change the working properties of your paints. But frankly, <laughs> for a set where you get 72 watercolors, six water brushes, two sponges, a palette of paper, and a plastic palette for around 
I mean, what are we, what are we, I can't even be mad. Like, what are we supposed to expect? And I don't really think this set was making big promises on like professional quality or artists recommend it. Like some of the palettes I'm going to be reviewing with you guys in the near future. This one is a very humble palette and I really appreciate that. You know, lower those expectations. So inside is a plastic tray. If I can get the water brush out. Actually, it's easier for me to get the cartridge out, which I'll talk about in a second. A very flimsy, cheap plastic tray. And then inset in the plastic... <laughs> oh. So these are not really in here. Like I, I'm used to them. So whenever I get these kind of cartridge systems, they usually click into place like with Cotman or Shapiro Farben. Not today, my friends. Not today. And now I gotta figure out which color is which. So it would be the bottom. So the second set, so light green and dark moss green. Does that correlate? It does not. What? Help? What? No, these don't core. Oh, this is, this is, this is really, this is really confusing. Okay, so there's their included swatch chart. This thing here doesn't even correlate one to one with that. <laughs> why? I, why? I'm sorry. I d just. I love it when even cheap art supplies, there can be some thought into their presentation and how they're laid out. This one, there isn't, and that's going to cause confusion for younger artists, for older artists, and it makes the color chart much harder to use. Mm. Anyway, moving on, let's talk about everything else they've included. So we have now, count them, six water brushes. These are fairly inexpensive water brushes. These are the kind you can very cheaply, very easily get on AliExpress. These have, they don't even have any kind of like gelatin or sizing in the brushes so far. Oh, they, <laughs> these are cheap. Ooh, I don't love water brushes all that much to begin with. So usually when a set sends a water brush, I don't even use it. Um, I know there are some artists who really like water brushes and they can really make them do wonders. I have water control with them because I'm heavy handed and I have a really tight grip. So I tend to squeeze too much water out of them. I mean, these are inexpensive water brushes. I, I need to at least test if they're gonna like leak all over the place. I need to use them at least a little bit. I owe you guys that much. Oh, these are so cheap. But I, I don't I don't love these. I would not want to use those myself at this point in time. The sponges are <laughs> very, it's like somebody described to Cool Bank what, what the like, theoretically what watercolors are and they're like yeah cool and they just kind of guessed because I think these are more useful for scrubbing your water brushes than for any kind of lift techniques the this plastic palette very very cheap uh, like I said you can get these down at Dollar Tree so you guys have seen these before they're not terrible it's a fine inclusion but they're not great and then we have our 24 sheet, 140 pound watercolor pad. It is definitely cellulose. It, de oh, it has a weird, can yeah, y'all can see. It's got kind of a weird texture and it feels like, even though it has a texture, it feels too smooth to be really good for watercolor. I know there's like hot press, which is a smooth texture, but this just feels like overly smooth drawing paper. I'm, I'm definitely gonna test it out in the review though. I'm just, I'm a little afraid y'all. I think, okay, so realistically, I purchased this for the paints, to review the paints for you guys. I think the paints are gonna be the best part. So all is not lost. It's just that everything else is kind of a trip. You know, on the bright side, I'm actually really glad that these are not those like weird long chiclets of cheap paint, like the Banyo palette I reviewed a million years ago. And I'm glad that they're not individually wrapped in plastic or foil, cause then I'd have to complain even more about waste. So there is definitely a sunny side to this. 
So I promise in this Unbox and Swatch review, I'm definitely going to try out and talk about everything they've included, but I want to focus first on the watercolors in this set. So like I said, we've got two color charts. <laughs> it's, it's such a mess because even this is like the opposite of the layout. It just makes it really challenging to find what's in this palette. I, oh, yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I am going to read all of these colors out to you in a uh, time lapse, I guess. I'm definitely gonna dub that because I'm gonna confuse myself trying to do it one-to-one. -one. So I'm gonna type that out and do it properly and then do it in post. And then I'm going to use the swatch chart they included to swatch them. And then we're going to use my own unbox and swatch method where I swatch them on a Blick Studio cotton rag watercolor block where we test for properties like opacity, we test for gradients, we test for granulation, we test for liftability. I'll do all that after I do this. And I am, I'm sorry, I don't love water brushes. So I'm not gonna use a water brush because I wanna be as fair to this set as possible, I'm gonna use one of my silver black velvet watercolor brushes and a cup of clean water and just change it out for you guys as many times as necessary. Colors from left to right, top to bottom, row by row. White, metallic, dark gray, kumquat pink, cerise camel, steel blue, cerulean blue, fresh leaves. Metallic silver, dark gray, dark goldenrod, light pink, vermilion, rose pink, sky blue, olive green. Peach puff, dim gray, khaki flamingo, dark maroon, light orchid, ultramarine coffee, forest green. Apricot black, jasmine, coral pink, saddle brown, medium orchid, dark mineral blue, moss green, dark green. Honey orange, mimosa, tangerine, pink pearl, orange red, indigo, Prussian blue, light green, dark moss green, dark peach, canary yellow, gold orange, coral, cherry red, light purple, sapphire, cyan blue, dark slate gray, nut brown, yellow, bronze, strong red, light coral, purple, mineral blue, foliage green, mint, black iron, golden rod, light camel, red, chocolate, opera mauve, heliotrope, grass green, and dark lividity. I also want to point out that I have had some really mixed experiences with Chinese watercolors. Some of my favorite brands from 2021, some of the most interesting standout watercolors I've reviewed this year have been Chinese like Superior and like CAM Supervision. And they've got some really, oh, and like Paul Rubens, they've got some really great contenders. And then, some of the worst watercolors I've ever reviewed have come from China. So I have high hopes that this one will be all right. There's definitely a lot of color here and it's nice to be able to recommend things to like scrapbookers, card makers, and people who like to color for relaxation. And they don't necessarily wanna spend a lot of time mixing up colors that they might not like anyway. And sometimes a big convenience palette with loads of colors ready to go is just so much easier than the Daniel Smith Essential 6, which technically can mix almost any colors you want, but you're gonna waste a lot of paint figuring out how to get those colors. So I definitely see validity in student grade sets like this one when the colors perform well, like with the Superior Folding Palette. and. I'm, I bought this not to rag on it, not to have a set to dunk on, not to have a watercolor set to take out all my frustrations of Hurricane Ida on. I bought it because I thought it might be genuinely good and I'm still hoping that it might be genuinely good. Like I said earlier, when I review student grade watercolors, I kind of review them to a different standard. So whatever dunking I do before I swatch, is mostly in good nature. Whatever dunking I do after I swatch is, yeah, me probably tearing the palette apart because it's not very good. Now to give these the best and fairest chance I possibly can, 
I am going to go ahead and pre-activate the palette with some clean water. Give it a chance to soak up that watery goodness, loosen up some of those pigments, and just hopefully really shine. So I feel like whoever named these colors relied too heavily on Google Translate because some of these colors are just not a great fit. For example, kumquat is more like a yellow ochre. It's probably named for the outside of the kumquat, but it's a bit confusing. Steel blue is a sky blue. Metallic dark gray is like a phthalo blue. Dark gray is a burnt sienna. Dark goldenrod is a bright warm yellow, but not really a goldenrod, which is closer to like an Indian yellow. Light pink is really a mid pink. Vermilion is really a mauve. Dim gray is a reddish violet. Flamingo is more neutral than one would expect of the name. Ultramarine is a turquoise. Forest green is an olive green. Jasmine is a kind of saddle brown. Dark mineral blue is lighter than expected. I assume this is named after the traditional Chinese watercolor palette's dark mineral blue, which would be a lighter sort of blue, but closer to ultramarine and much more saturated. Moss green is a yellow green. Dark green is a teal. Indigo is a sky blue. Prussian blue is an indigo. Dark peach is more like a vermilion. Cyan blue is more like malachite or light green. Dark slate gray is Van Dyke brown. Nut brown is a teal. Light coral is closer to Venetian red. Purple is more like a pink. Mineral blue is an umber. Black iron is closer to peacock blue. Goldenrod is just flat out orange. And dark lividity is what Google Translate thinks iron red or blood red is in English. And this might seem like I'm nitpicking, but some of these colors are commonly used by other companies, including professional grade companies, and I'm pointing out the biggest disparities that have caused confusion for me while swatching and might lead to confusion for other artists. Student grade is supposedly meant for students to, students to learn on, a cheaper version that they can use up. If colors are named incorrectly, then students learn the wrong color name connection and might select the wrong colors in the future when buying from tubes or half pans and feel frustrated with their choices. A little research on Cool Bake's part would help rectify this confusion. If it's a translation issue, double checking would also help. And there is definitely a lot of optical brighteners in them. Oh boy! Pink looks like a hot pink or an opera at mass tone. It's more of a light bubble gun at full saturation. The white is having a chemical reaction with the black alcohol marker I used to demonstrate opacity. These are definitely something and I've only swatched the first row. I am curious about what the binder in these are. Gum Arabic can be a bit pricey for really budget watercolors to splurge on. These get really soupy and gloppy once they've absorbed water and really want to glop up on the brush, causing a lot of wasted paint. This means you're going to go through your paints a lot faster and it's going to glop up on your paper and it's going to make color control really challenging. And these are a trip. Water control with these on the included swatch map is a real struggle. These are going to be really interesting to swatch on the cotton rag because 72 watercolors is a lot of watercolor. I may have to find an abbreviated format which still hits all the right tick marks, maybe smaller boxes or rectangles. I also want to let y'all know that the humidity is fierce in Louisiana lately. So a lot of the human error swatch issues with this sheet, like all the blooms, has more to do with water control issues and not the paints themselves at this point in time. It also has to do with the fact that the back of the swatch card is coated with something kind of plasticky, which means water can't even evaporate through the back. It just sort of sits there and puddles because there's nowhere for the water to go. This material for the swatch card is just a really poor choice. I also want to point out that this has been time-lapsed 8x and it still takes up a fair chunk of the video so you guys can only imagine how long it takes to swatch 72 watercolors in real time.
these cool bank watercolors are kind of a trip and not necessarily in a good way. I have a lot of water control issues over here, so I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not going to judge cool bank watercolors just based on how their cellulose swatch sheet handled and the issues I had with this. I'm gonna wait until after we've swatched it on cotton rag paper to give it my full judgment. But I gotta say, swatching 72 watercolors is, oh, it takes a long time. And just think, I've got the 90 pan See Me Art palette to review for you guys in the future. So with these larger palettes, swatching all the colors starts to become kind of a space issue. But it is nice to have a lot of colors on hand, a lot of colors handy, especially if you're not particularly confident in your color mixing or hey, you just want to paint something really quick like you're a commission artist. Swatching 72 watercolors is going to be a little bit of a problem, so I'm not going to do it quite the same way I normally do my unbox and swatch swatches. This is my Dick Blick cotton rag watercolor pad. This is 100% cotton rag and I use this for almost all, if not at this point all, of my unbox and swatch reviews. So this is kind of the de facto standard and it allows me to compare this watercolor against all the other watercolors I've reviewed because this has been a constant. It's kind of like with my field test, I almost always use Stonehenge Aqua Cold Press for that. It's just another similarity that makes it easier to compare everything. So normally I would do a couple of stripes of Copic marker to test opacity and to test bleeding out or blending out. We got 72 colors here and it's already gonna be a bear to film. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna do a rectangular swatch. I've gotta get nine of them across. This is 12 by nine. So I've gotta get nine of them across. So about an inch and a half is what I'm kind of going for. And uh, I'm gonna try to blend it out as I go. And then I'm gonna do a mass tone swatch if I have room at the top. And I'm gonna try to straddle each of these black lines because that'll give us some idea as to opacity. And for these black lines, I used a Sakura Micron. So it shouldn't reactivate with the water. I'm hoping it won't resist either. I always feel a little bit ridiculous swatching white watercolor on white paper because it doesn't really, you know, show up. But I wanted to swatch all 72 for you guys. And that also means the white. So these swatch so much better on the Blick Studio than on that weird included swatch card. These are so much nicer on a decent cotton rag. It's seriously like night and day and gives me hope that these watercolors might be fun for the field test and perform better than I anticipated. On the cotton rag, these colors have sort of a traditional Chinese watercolor palette or Gansai feel to them, which y'all know I love. Now that said, these dry a lot lighter than expected. So maybe aiming for a light and airy pastel piece might be the best way to go with these. I know with the Mia, they were way less saturated than I bargained for, and I had to mix them so saturated that wet into wet techniques proved basically impossible. Just from some of the color movement while swatching these, I know it'll move. It's making sure I don't overload the brush with extenders, binders, and gum Arabic is really the key here. So for the field test, I know I'm going to be painting on a cotton rag watercolor paper. It's probably going to be Stonehenge Aqua because that's what I use for the majority of my field test illustrations. And it's probably going to be something, maybe a modified something from my Lilliputian Living series, unless I have an idea for this that's just inspired by these paints. We'll see. I'll do some thumbnails and see what kind of speaks to me. But you guys can see these blend out decently well, at least here in this kind of limited capacity. When you've got 72 colors to work with, sometimes space can be a bit of an issue. Now, some of y'all watching this, y'all probably work with a very limited palette, six to 12 colors, and that's fantastic. If you can get everything you want out of 12 colors, that's 
that's great. But for people who do watercolor comics or a lot of watercolor illustration, sometimes you just want to paint fast and having a bunch of handy convenience colors that don't require a lot of mixing can allow you to paint faster. So there's a reason why the super big palettes are so appealing, especially for people who are buying for younger artists. They think more colors is more better. And that's kind of hit or miss because as you guys can see, we have a lot of really similar colors. I mean, when you've got a 72 color range, that's definitely to be expected. You're going to have a lot of really close colors, but I don't think you necessarily need all of these colors to paint an illustration that you'll enjoy and you'll be happy with. I'm usually happy with 24 to 48 colors, but that's just personal preference on my part. Okay, these swatch so much better on cotton rag paper. There's still some issues. They're kind of desaturated, but that's probably something we can chalk up to the extenders and optical brighteners. But if you are going to use the Cool Bank watercolors and you have any choice at all, cotton rag paper is really the way I'd recommend you go. I mean, let's compare. This is the paper that they included. It's a cellulose paper and it has kind of a finish on the back, a coating on the back. Oh, these were such a struggle to use on this paper. Blooming, water control issues, color control issues. These look terrible. These look like I don't have any idea whatsoever what I'm doing. Whereas I spent probably slightly less care on these. I'm not gonna pretend like they're perfect because I never aim for perfect, but they're much better and they're a much better reflection of the colors in this palette. This is more appealing than what I did here. If this was being used to sell this palette, nobody would buy this. This, maybe so. I definitely can see potential in it. This sort of reminds me of a 72 pen Gansai style watercolor palette. I'm seeing a lot of similarities between the Chinese watercolors that I've been reviewing for a while. So like the Superior palette or the Mei Liang palette, for example, the sort of colors that are included in those palettes and the Gansai palette. So like the Kuratake Gansai Tombi palette, I'm seeing a lot of, you know, similar color since those art styles have influenced one another. I'm seeing a lot of that here in the Cool Bank palette. Now, I said earlier that I was pretty sure this was a white label product. I don't know for a fact that information is really hard to come by, but I would put good money that these are Chinese watercolors. Um, from the presentation, the choice of names and the choice of colors, these seem like they would be Chinese watercolors. And that's neither good nor bad. Like I said earlier, I've reviewed some great ones and I've reviewed some terrible ones. And so far, these aren't too bad. I would, I think I like these better than I liked the Shapira Farben during their unboxing swatch, but then I really liked Shapira Farben during the field test. And I really liked the Mia watercolors during the Mia field, uh, unboxing swatch. And I hated them during the field test. So sometimes when you sit down and you paint a full illustration, that really changes things. So that is me encouraging you guys to, if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button, plan on sticking around and keep an eye out for the field test for the Cool Bank watercolors. Cause I am really curious to see how these are going to handle in an illustration sort of situation. So here are our Cool Bank watercolors swatched on our cotton rag watercolor paper. They've had a chance to fully dry. So next I'm going to do the lift test. And for that, normally I would use a slightly scrubbier synthetic watercolor flat for that. But I don't happen to have that with me because I've got the evacuation blues. So instead, I'm going to be using this silver black velvet flat that I have instead. And this is going to kind of tell us a few different things. It's important to me, but it might not be important for every artist. The more lifting, like overly lifting, some colors are. So let's say a watercolor is really finely granulated. You're not seeing any noticeable granulation. You're not seeing any sort of sedimentation in the color, but it lifts really easily. 
that's a color that's going to be prone to turning to mud because really finely granulated watercolors have a tendency to be staining rather than granulating and they have a tendency to be staining rather than lifting so if they sh lift there's something wrong there and that's kind of a clue how they're going to handle during the field test some of the more opaque colors are a bit more lifting, which isn't unusual. In general, slightly lifting, but not totally lifting. So if applied judiciously, these shouldn't turn to mud on you. So kind of surprisingly, these aren't really that lifty. Oh sure, some of them lift more than others. The more opaque colors are always going to be a little more prone to lifting. That's pretty common. But in general, these aren't super lifting. There's some staining properties to them, which I gotta be real. I thought these were gonna like leave right off, lift right off the page and leave white streaks behind. So. This actually bodes really well. I do wish there was more granulation with these watercolors. Everything is kind of milled to the same degree. And you know me, I like me some granulation, but it's not a deal breaker. It's just something that I'm going to keep in mind when selecting an illustration to use for the field test. So now that we have finished our lift test, I'm gonna change focus just a little bit and I'm going to do a little bit of swatching on the included cellulose watercolor pad. And if you look closely, this isn't even watercolor, it's a digitized image meant to represent watercolor, which doesn't necessarily mean good things. So this is a cellulose watercolor paper. It's about 140 pounds, so it's a little bit heavier than cardstock. It is definitely an embossed paper. And you can even see the embossment all the way on the back, which is also not the most promising. So I'm gonna do a few different things with this paper, but for right now, while we're still in color swatching mode, all I'm gonna do is do a little swatch of all of our 72 colors minus the white onto this paper. And that'll kind of give us an idea of how these paints work with this paper if you were to use the set as intended. Their paper isn't the worst paper I've ever tried. That honor goes to the Shapiro Farben pad. And it might be a lot of fun with alcohol markers, but it's a poor match with their paints and probably a poor match with any watercolors, really. It might work okay, though, with like those uh, dye-based watercolor brush pens that have the individual nylon bristles, like the Kuratake or the Colorit, those style ones. It reflects poorly though on the Cool Bank watercolors. It really makes them look a lot worse than they are. So if you do decide to purchase this set or give it as a gift, I'd swap out the paper. The colors look muted, dingy, and kind of dirty on this paper, especially when, when compared with how they look on the cotton rag paper. I would not recommend using this paper with these paints, but I might try this paper out with alcohol markers later on because the texture is kind of fun and it'd be neat with markers. For an inexpensive alternative, I prefer Canson's XL watercolor paper, but really cotton rag is going to do these paints the most justice. So generally with watercolor, you can, um, it's brushes, paints, and paper, and you can use cheap paints 
on a nice paper and end up with a much better result than if you use nice paints on a cheap paper. And I typically like to go with a middle of the range brush like the silver black velvet brushes because they're just kind of good all rounders and they're typically pretty solid and it's pretty difficult to ruin them. So I'm also doing some blending wet into wet tests on this paper just to kind of play around with the colors. So this is what the swatches look like on their paper. <laughs> I do not have high hopes for this paper because you can see we're getting a lot of like pooling areas. Basically these watercolors aren't going to dry until they fully evaporate into the atmosphere. Nothing is actually sitting soaking into the paper itself, which is not uncommon with cellulose watercolor papers, but Frankly, I think I like Canson XL watercolor paper better than this, and that is a pretty cheap watercolor paper. So it's got an interesting texture, but it doesn't really play well with these particular watercolors. We do get some interesting effects, but everything looks kind of dull, dingy, and chalky on this paper. Whereas on the cotton rag, everything looks a lot brighter, a lot cleaner. We can get a better idea for the colors in this palette. Of course, both of these are better than the paper they chose for the swatch sheet. So go figure there. Well, friends, I dare say we're almost all swatched out. So now we can focus on some color mixing. I'm going to be doing two types of color mixing demonstrations for you guys today. We're going to do atomic or manual mixing where we physically mix two colors together using the included palette. Finally, we get to test out the palette. And I'm also going to be doing what's known as optical mixing where I apply a color and then I glaze or layer another color on top of it once it had a chance to fully dry. And both of these are important because it's going to give us a lot of information about how well these paints actually handle as paints rather than how well these paints handle as swatches. So since we have so many colors to choose from, realistically, you're not really going to need to mix colors in order to get the colors that you might want. But being able to mix colors is a really handy thing to have because sometimes you want to tweak it just a little bit and you're not going to be able to do that with the colors that you already have in the palette. So I'm gonna start with a cooler yellow, the one down here on the bottom, and I'm already kind of having a little bit of trouble selecting my colors. So I'll grab a little bit of blue here. We should be able to get a nice green out of it. I did not pre-activate my watercolors this time because I found that that kind of turned them to mud. I am noticing that this is kind of a muddy color mix here. It really should be like kind of a bright springish green and it's really more it's not too bad like on paper it's all right so if we add more yellow to the mix and then if we add more blue to the mix so we should be able to get some nuanced colors out of this next I'm gonna take a warmer yellow And the included palette is all right. Like I said, we have a lot of colors to choose from, so I'm a little bit at a loss at exactly what to grab. But it doesn't really matter. That's a good orange there. Let's add some more yellow. Hmm, not really a whole lot of difference there. And I do actually want to see a fair amount of difference in between the mixes. Nice bright reddish orange there and the included palette isn't too bad I mean it, it works about like you think it would so I want kind of like an ultramarine I want a warmer blue now Ooh, that's that's not a good pick let me pick again the color map is also like not really that accurate so it's actually very challenging to mix colors that might not be what I'm looking for, but that's okay. If it doesn't work, I'll try, try again. And I'll go with red, which is a cooler red. I'm looking to make some purples here. Ooh, that's kind of pretty. So let's add some more red. We should get a red violet. Let's 
add a bunch more blue. We should get, hmm, that's not really the kind of purple I'm looking for. That's more the purple we're looking for. Not bad, okay. So we can actually do some color mixing with these. Now I'm gonna do some more unusual mixes just to see what we can kind of get. So let's take one of the many, many pinks. And let's grab one of our many, many blues. Ooh, okay. We get kind of a pretty little baby purple. Add a little bit more pink to that. That's rather pretty. Add more blue. Not bad, not bad. Okay, let's take our kind of ultramarine color and then grab we have so many browns that's one plus side to this is you should be able to do skin tones without having to mix the colors too too much because that's one of the areas where the mia watercolors really fell apart was the darker skin tones i guess i'm gonna grab it's so hard for me to orient myself on this palette I want to get a good brown that would work for a Payne's Gray. There we go. Not bad. Okay. Oh, what blue did I grab? So it seems like, just from this unboxing swatch test, that we can do some half decent color mixing. And we've got so many colors that it's a little overwhelming. So I'm gonna grab this kind of minty color here. And then I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna be awful. This is, who knows if this is any good. It probably isn't. I'm gonna grab a little bit of orange. Okay, all right, not, oh, ooh, that's kind of a nice color there. I have to remember that. Let's go with more mint. And then let's go with more orange. Now keep in mind, ooh, yeah. These are going to be a lot lighter than what you might expect. I really like this color with the flamingo kind of pink and the, oh gosh, um, kind of like a vertiver blue. That's a really pretty like sunset sort of color. So not bad. All right, so, so far we can do some manual atomic mixing. We can take two colors, smash them together and get a third color. And I know you're probably wondering why would you wanna do that? You've got so many colors in here. Well, it's actually really useful for adjusting things to fit what you're actually painting. So now I'm gonna do my optical which involves painting a color grid. I'm gonna keep it kind of simple. That's our cool yellow. That's our warm yellow. Our warm red. Our cool red. And you might find it helpful to mark the primaries on here with a marker just so that you can find them more easily because they're not really named that well. That is our, this is really more like a cobalt blue than an ultramarine blue. So I'm also going to tempt. I don't really think there's a good ultramarine blue in here. Use this kind of sky blue. Oh, that's not really an ultramarine blue, but that's okay. And then our cool blue. Now I'm gonna let these dry totally, completely and fully and then we'll do our crosshairs. Now that these have had a chance to dry, I'm gonna go ahead and do our second layer on the grid, trying to use the same colors I used the first time. The fact that these aren't labeled and that their color grid is mm -hmm, a little bit off kilter does make using these a little bit harder, but I do think the more that you use them, the more you're going to get used to them but if you really like them, I recommend making your own color reference and that's gonna be a little bit easier on you. So far, these seem like they glaze okay, 
I want to do just a little bit more testing, so I'm going to make a fairly large block. Actually, I can play around with the wet into wet blends like this. So we've got a cool blue. We've got a warmer blue. I'm painting a large block of that. Then we're going to start with our cool red. And our warmer red. These do seem to blend wet into wet pretty nicely. And then we'll do our cooler yellow. And our warmer yellow. And those are some nice diffused wet into wet blends anyway. In fact, I can't help it. I'm sorry, y'all. I'll do one more on this nicer paper. We've got our yellow. Oh, no, I want teal. One of these is a teal. I know one of these is a teal. And that's not a very nice way for me to do wet into wet, but it's okay. And then we'll do our dark blue. Just for fun. Just, just to demonstrate. Now I am seeing some cloudy, some muddiness, but I'm also seeing some really pretty granulation up there. So I'm gonna let these dry and I'll try to glaze on top of these as well. And this is gonna give us a larger area and it's gonna tell us a little bit more about how well these handle with optical mixing. So I'm stopping midway through my second optical blending test just to point out that these did some wet into wet blending better than I expected them to. For some reason, this area here really pooled. Um, I'm not sure if it was a paints thing or if it was a high Louisiana humidity thing. Uh, I've been doing everything I can to do humidity control. So, you know, who knows? Anyway. What I want to do next is I want to do a gradient of these three colors going the other way and uh, just kind of see how that handles, see if I can get clean effects. I noticed there was a little bit of color migration there, but not a whole lot and uh, see if I can do some nice layered wet into wet. So this has actually had a couple of hours to dry, but it is raining outside. So I'm going to turn on my dehumidifier and do this in time lapse. This second layer isn't fully dry, but given tonight, it probably won't be for a while. So I'm going to go ahead and move, and move on. I think we can see a lot of what we need to see anyway. So some of these colors are prone to movement if you rewet them, even if they fully dried originally, which is not uncommon for watercolors that have a lot of optical brighteners in them. They're also kind of chalky. You can see how we end up with some really like chalky mixes, like especially up here where you just see some of the white of the optical brightener start to shine through. But also over here with some of these lighter blues, there's just a chalky quality to them. That doesn't make them the worst, but it's something you definitely want to keep in mind because it's going to change how you handle these paints and what you can do with these paints. So I have tested these paints out on nice cotton rag paper. Now it's time to actually start trying out some of the other things included in this kit. So starting with, or not really, returning to the watercolor pad, I've also filled up the included water brushes and if there was any sizing in the bristles, I went ahead and rinsed that out. And we're gonna be revisiting the included palette, which isn't actually that bad, and our rubber sponges. So I think I've mentioned to you guys before, I'm really not really a water brush person. It's a preference. Um, these seem pretty cheap. There's a lot of bristles that are just not where they ought to be. So these are not 
the highest quality water brushes, but we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna give them a, a, a fair shot, a test run even. And uh, that's gonna give us a little bit more information about the paints, the palette, the brushes, you know, the kit part of the kit. So I'm gonna start with the larger flats. We have three flats in this kit and we have three rounds in various sizes. This one is a fun trip because when you're recapping it, you gotta make sure to squeeze the bristles in gently to make sure that they actually fit into the, into the cap without ruining them. And this, ooh, does it even cap? Kinda, it kinda posts. This is very reminiscent of a style that you used to be able to get through Jerry's Artorama. It wasn't a particularly good style. The reason I don't love water brushes is, as I've said a few other times, I'm kinda heavy handed. So they start to leak on me and I have a lot of difficulty controlling the water. In fact, these are leaking in my hand as I use them. So I'm gonna use this brush. In fact, it is very leaky. These are really not well made. I'm gonna use this, wow, such leak, much leak. Yeah, these, these sponges are just not an effective cleaning tool. This is why you got, it would rather leak than actually go through the bristles. Yeah, this is why you guys don't really see me use water brushes or the included sponges often because for me, they're just more trouble than they're worth. Some artists don't have these kind of problems and they, they probably stain the bristles so maybe I've gotten all the pink out of it. Um, don't have these kind of problems? I do. I'm a big, big advocate for working with the art supplies that work for what you, oh, these are so leaky, that work with the kind of art you want to make and the kind of skills you have artistically. I'm not really a believer in fighting to get art supplies to do certain things. And you squeeze to get it more watery, but this one wants to drip. So water control with these, at least these, these larger flat brushes, and that's not super uncommon. These tend to be very, very prone to leaking and prone to staining, which I don't really care about, but it makes it hard to tell when you've cleaned all the color out of your brush. Okay, so I have, I have the small, and this one seems to be built along the lines a little bit more of the round brushes. So maybe I won't have the leak issues that I am currently dealing with. This is also the hardest one to uncap. I have to take it off camera and kind of struggle with it for a while to get that cap to come off. This one already doesn't seem quite as prone to just leaking water all over the place. Also, if they leak in your hand, they're gonna leak anytime they're under pressure. So if you like to bring these things when you're flying or traveling, they will leak on the plane and that has happened to me before. This one's a little bit better than the other ones. The other ones were really, really not fun. I'm, I'm not gonna keep these. These are probably going in the trash because these are some of the worst made water brushes I've experienced. Okay, so now on to the rounds. But let me know in the uh, comments below if you happen to be a fan of water brushes. If you like how they handle, if they're your preference. Because I feel like this is a one-sided argument. I'm, I don't love them. The rounds are a little bit better. They're a little better made. They're a little less leaky. The plastic on these is really thin. So it takes like no hand pressure at all to start maybe using more water than you might want to. But if you're not heavy handed, maybe that's not an issue for you. Ooh, y'all can't see it, but I can see all the white optical brighteners come into the forefront with these paints. They're still kind of fun though. I don't love, love everything about this kit. Like this paper is not a good match. The sponge is actually working okay. Uh, to clean the, the rounds at least. I'm getting some of the paint out of them. That's another thing with these water brushes. You have to expel so much water just to clean them that if like I take it out in the field and I wanna do some like plain air painting, I have to refill them using an eyedropper constantly. So it's just, it's not really a good match for how I paint. And these are not 
very nice water brushes. Yeah, I I don't I don't like these water brushes. Another thing about this pad is you want to have a clip of some sort handy because it is not really not really good for water. So what I want to try to do next is I want to like get a lot of water on the paper and then try to use this to do some lifting and I guess I need to bring back the palette which is kind of the least offensive sorry about that kind of the least offensive part of this so well look I am evacuated I've been staying at my mom's house for a month and Dax which is their kitten I've shown you Dax he's the the kitten they adopted from an O'Reilly's he was hiding in the wheel well of my brother's jeep he's getting old enough that he wants to he both wants Bowie's attention and wants to pick fights constantly so that's kind of what's going on in the background and um I'm trying to referee it but Dax also needs to learn some cat behavior and we don't have another kitten that he can play with. So unfortunately, Bowie is stuck being the, the babysitter here. So I, if you guys hear cat or walling, it's, it's Dax being learning how to cat, basically. And Bowie having zero patience for this pushy kitten. So I'm trying to cover a large area. Um, it's a very humid night tonight. And this cellulose paper is not really staying wet so I'm gonna go ahead and yeah this this brush this this sponge doesn't want to absorb anything <laughs> it's plastic um oh you know what though the thing about sponges is they're more they're gonna absorb better if you pre-soak them I forgot about that it's kind of ah, ah don't don't get all over the dust it's kind of like brushes you make them basically kind of thirsty so I've soaked it in my rinse water and let's see not not really it's just adding a lot of water it is lifting some I really need to like try using a brush not a brush a sponge for texture at some point anyway but I don't I don't think it's meant to be used for that or if it is it's not the not really very good at it so this paper, that sponge, these brushes, it's its not really a great combination. I, I really feel like they chose some of these add-ons to just kind of round this out so they could have like a everything you need to get started painting today kind of kit. And none of them are really a good, none of them other, the paints are okay. Um, I, I'll probably do a field test with these paints. They are okay enough that I feel like I could possibly render an illustration. Might, might not love the end result. It might be like the Mia where I'm like, oh, that was a cute sketch, but now it's kind of funky looking. But that's okay. You know, that's what the field test is for. To figure out if the paints are actually something I can recommend, something that's actually kind of fun. I do kind of like the color selection though. And I think they would make for a fun color challenge. And you can get some fun blends and stuff with them. And the, the plastic palette they've included is, is fine. It's not the best. That's kind of an interesting texture though. And you do get some neat blossoms. And then some of these paints are like weirdly staining too. Like, like that. It's more like a dye base watercolor. So... I don't love that particular sponge, but now I'd like to try maybe a natural sponge and see if I might enjoy that. So at the very least, the accessories from the Cool Bank watercolor kit are inspiring me to try more serious versions of the same thing. I'd have to get involved because Dax is not taking no for an answer. But I, look, if you're going to buy this kit, I would recommend scrapping all, <laughs> all of the accessories. <laughs> and the paints are fine. The paints alone are worth your $20.99. You're getting 72 
paints for $20.99 and they're not like the world's, they're not the greatest paints, okay? There's a warning sign when a watercolor half pan is less than a dollar. That's the red flag of like, maybe you shouldn't. But sometimes you can get some passable watercolors like this. Like I like this palette a lot better than that terrible Artist Loft palette I reviewed a long time ago that used to be very popular with brush calligraphers and hand letters. This thing's already a lot better than that thing. And um, it's better than some of like the Banyo and maybe better than the Jerry Q palette that I reviewed a while back. It might be on par with the Jerry Q palette, but it's better than the Banyo. So I've, <laughs> I've reviewed worse. It is very solidly in the student grade category. Um, you can do some fun things with it. You can do some color mixing with it. You can do some layering with it. If you're gonna keep your watercolors kind of loose and airy, it might be a good a good fit for you. Um, I am having a lot of difficulty. So a lot of these companies promise non-toxic, but a lot of them are manufactured in China and you can't find a lot of company information about them since they're white labeled products. So I cannot ascertain whether or not these are made with non-toxic pigments. So basically what I would say is if you're giving this to a younger artist, make sure it's somebody old enough to know that they shouldn't eat their watercolors. They shouldn't paint their watercolors on their hands. They shouldn't put them on the pets. They shouldn't put it on the wall. Um, but this could be great for a preteen or a teenager, especially someone who will pick up their art supplies and not just leave them laying around for the family cat to drink their watercolor water. And I, I say that as someone who has spent years of chasing Bowie out of my watercolor water. So there's absolutely no judgment there. And there's some neat kind of funky stuff going on. But I think I enjoy it because... And there's some nice bloom effects. So these sponges aren't... Maybe they're okay for adding like a lot of water to the paper and forcing a bloom. But I think they have too even a texture. And I think a natural sponge would just be a better fit for this than these pucks of plastic. Ah, it's, it's kind of fun to play around with. And it's nice to have a watercolor set that's at least good enough that I can be like, it is cheap and your kids will love it. Or it is cheap and it's good. It would be an okay fit for card making. It's cheap. It might be okay for convention commission so long as you let them know. I haven't done any light fast testing on this kit, but I would not... I would not uh, trust these pigments not to fade, not to flake, not to in some capacity fail on you. So if you were doing convention commissions, I would highly recommend you price them according to the materials. And I would highly recommend you disclose to your customers that it, this is a commission that might not last the test of time and that uh, it should not be displayed in direct sunlight. There's a lot of people who will still who would still be interested in that kind of a commission because something that I've noticed people do, and I think it's really cool. I don't do this because I like to frame them, but um, I've noticed that people will have sketchbooks and they're just full of different commissions of like their main, their original character or the main character in their story or their D&D &D character. And I, I love those kind of commissions. Like I love doing them. And I love seeing all the other artists. And I think that's a really cool idea. This would be okay for that. All right, y'all. It's that time of the evening. It's time to talk about the pros and cons of the Cool Bank watercolor set. Purchased on Amazon for $20.99 with free prime shipping. So let's start with the pros. I really like the sturdy metal carrying case these come in. It has a hinge and it also has a divot on the lid. I'm not gonna be able to show you guys, but so that it actually snaps closed fairly securely. If you're gonna travel with this thing though, I would recommend using a little bit of washi tape to tape it shut. This set has a whole lot of color. Um, it's kind of reminiscent of the 72 pan Gansai palettes in terms of the selection and some of the unusual for the U.S. market names like uh, Dark Lividity. Boy, that brings me back to when I was translating using Google Translate those uh, Akashia Gansai pans. Dark Lividity came up then too. 
You can get some really pretty atomic mixes from this color selection because there's a lot of weird pinks and pastels. These handle decently well on cotton rag watercolor papers, so this might not be a bad set if you don't mind spending your money on paper but want to go cheaper on your paint. And the colors are quick to activate and really do not need pre-activation. Please don't pre-activate them. They turn to soup and glop up onto your brush. Okay, so what about the cons? These have a lot of optical brighteners and extenders, which not only affect how the paints handle, but how quickly you go through paint and how saturated the paints are or are not. These can probably only take limited layering. So if you really like to layer on the layers like I do, this is probably not the best set for you. These can take limited wet into wet blending. So if you're really reliant on wet into wet for soft graduated color transitions, and you want to layer those kind of soft graduated color transitions like I did with the superior watercolor field test, this is not really the best pick either. The paper included is not, in my opinion, a good fit for the watercolors. The colors dry a lot lighter than they go down, so these are better suited to artists with a light hand or who want to use a light touch rather than someone who's going for lots of saturation or trying to create some atmosphere. And y'all, really, the accessories are mostly awful. If you're going to buy this kit, I would say scrap almost all of them. The plastic included palette, this one here, and the paints are fine. Everything else is very, uh, and the color mapping sheet has this weird coating on the back. So these look awful compared to all of the other swatches that I've done with these watercolors. But the paper included with this pad is still pretty terrible. It's just a little bit better than this thing here. So how does this palette compare to some of the other student grade watercolor palettes that I've reviewed recently? I would say it's somewhere between the Mia palette and the Shapira Farben palette. I'm still evacuated, so I'm going to include some existing footage of those palettes just so that you guys have a basis of comparison. So the Shapiro Farben palette was kind of a sleeper hit for me. It wasn't really promising during the unboxing swatch, but on the heels of the Mia Fail Test, it performed much better and had way more colors and a palette design that I preferred. While it's still definitely student grade and not as good as the Superior or Mei Liang, it's definitely not bad and one I could recommend if you're looking to buy the if you're not looking to buy the Superior or Mei Liang palettes for whatever reason. And the Mia palette. This thing was really promising during the unboxing swatch and I know other artists do like it, but it really fell apart for me during the field test. Every tick mark I want watercolors to hit, it failed. The colors weren't saturated enough. When I could get them saturated enough, they were gloppy. The optical brighteners were noticeable and they made my work look amateur. And that's what everything, it encapsulates everything I don't like about student grade watercolors other than the price point, which was just fine. I'm gonna keep saying it, but I really recommend you skip the Mia palette in favor of one of the many other palettes I've reviewed in the past. You guys can check out my Mia field test and I can give you guys some great recommendations for watercolor palettes that cost about the same and perform so much better. So what's my verdict? Off the bat, I think this could be a great palette for brush calligraphers and hand lettering artists. It's way better than that Artist Loft Cheapo palette that was all the rage on Instagram for a few years. This set also seems like it's good for people who dabble in watercolor. Maybe they want to add a bit of color here and there, or they have a very light usage in terms of layering. This could be a good set for a comic artist who wants to work with preset colors and not have to do a whole lot of color mixing doesn't plan on doing much layering, and plans on working on nicer papers. This is kind of a tricky one. I'm getting both Mia and Shapiro Farben vibes off of this. It could be an unsung gem or it could be absolutely terrible. Really only the field test is going to be able to give me the information I need. So hopefully you guys will stick around and check out the field test. 
The accessories are mostly laughable. The paper isn't suited to watercolor, the water brushes are all super cheap, the sponges aren't useful for what they're supposed to do, and only the palette is passable. However, the paints themselves are worth the asking price. I mainly gripe about the accessories because I know fighting with art supplies can turn some folks off of a media or technique, and I want the people buying this to know that they're better off with a different paper, brushes, and sponges, or better yet, a good paper towel. I won't know for sure how I feel about the Cool Bank watercolor palette until I do the field test, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement with the palette maps and accessories, and I hope Cool Bank will take the suggestions, but uh, I kind of doubt it. This watercolor review was made possible thanks to the generosity of my amazing patrons on Patreon. I use the funds generated from my Patreon every month to buy new art supplies to review. If you enjoyed this review, it would really mean a lot to me if you left a thumbs up, maybe left a comment about what you learned or what you found useful in this, because that kind of helps me decide where to focus my reviews in the future. And if you'd consider subscribing because I review a lot of watercolors and other art supplies that are appealing to watercolor comic artists and I've got a lot of great stuff planned. This is just one of a large showdown for water uh, student grade watercolor palettes. So if you're interested in watercolor and you wanna save a lot of money and you don't mind waiting, I've got Buku art supply reviews coming up for you guys. Bringing it right back, this went to my patrons first. And if you guys join me over on Patreon, you too will get early access to my tutorials and art supply reviews. You'll also get access to printable line arts, just part of the perks of being one of my patrons, as well as access to the materials that I create for my art classes. So if you're interested in making comics and you wanna benefit from my SCAD education, my MFA in sequential art, you'll join me over at Patreon at patreon.com slash natosoup. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope y'all found this helpful, useful, and most of all informative. And hopefully this review will help you guys find art more accessible, more affordable, and I'll help y'all make art a habit. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I hope you guys are safe, happy, and healthy wherever you are. So what did you guys think of the Cool Bank watercolor set? Is it worth the $20.99? Are you gonna pass on this one? There's a lot to like about this palette, but there's a lot of problems with the accessories included with the palette. So in the field test, which is coming up soon, I am not going to talk about the sponges. I'm not gonna talk about the water brushes and I'm not gonna use the paper they've included. I'm gonna focus just on the palette itself. I think that is the fairest review possible. Now, I do think this 72 color set is worth the price tag of $20.99 by itself. I didn't really need these accessories, but I can understand how somebody who doesn't have a plethora of art supplies might find this appealing. My recommendation though is to go get yourself a Canson XL watercolor pad or sketchbook that's gonna be a better paper and pick up a few traditional watercolor brushes or higher quality water brushes because the accessories included in this kit other than the inexpensive plastic palette which you can find at Dollar Tree most of them are, are like bad facsimiles of what they're supposed to be and I think you would be better off and happier in the long term going out and picking up what I recommended and using that with this kit. So I had a lot of fun reviewing this palette. I was actually really surprised because I thought this was going to be absolutely terrible and while it does have its flaws it's not horrible at all. It's actually okay. And I'm looking forward to doing the field test, really putting it through its paces and actually getting to paint something with it. So if you're new here, remember to hit that subscribe button and click like on this video if you enjoyed it. Let me know down in the comments below what other watercolor palettes you'd like to see me review. And you can check my community tab for a poll where I am allowing you guys to pick which palette I'm gonna review next because I've got many. And keep an eye out for the final showdown results at the very, very, very end of this ongoing series. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. I hope y'all enjoyed it, I sure did. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye guys.